Hi everybody and a very pleasant good day to you wherever you may be. Welcome to this webinar by Jerry Brewer of East Bay Hitting Instruction called The Hitting Paradox and Building a Robust Swing. So, like I said, welcome. You know, what is the motivation? You know, you may know me, I'm an engineer, and so I'm going to kind of bring this aspect to this hitting problem. We're going to talk about that a little bit today. As far as from what you can hope to get, you know, whether you're a coach or a player, how can you use this video? You know, first off, there's no magic drills or templates. I'm not going to give you any kind of a program or what to go on. We are going to see a case study at the end. But, uh, you know, by the, um, by the most part, I'm just trying to introduce some things, you know, get us to ask questions of ourselves. You know, Lord knows I wouldn't have agreed with everything I'm going to present today. So I'm not uh, a year ago, so I'm not going to ask you to. I probably won't agree with all of this a year from now. But I'm just trying to present this and get it out and, and get us thinking because pitchers are killing us as, as hitting coaches. I'm going to bounce around a little bit in a nonlinear fashion, kind of like what's presented in Make It Stick. It's a very good book on how we learn. And so, you know, when you're done with this, you know, whether you hate this video or whether you like this video, I really recommend a um, webinar by the BPG guys. You know, they did a, a very good uh, video on looking at pitching from a dynamic systems standpoint. It kind of gave me the motivation to do this, and I took a lot of stuff from them. And so uh, I really recommend that as well. So that said, you know, I gave you this catchy, t uh, this catchy subject, you know, this hitting paradox. You know, where does this, what does this come from? Where does this mean? And, and where this comes from, you know, a couple of years ago when I got on Twitter, um, I would put stuff out and people would send me a video. And I, I tried it out. I tried doing remote training for free for a while. And um, I really just liked it. And um, so if you're seeing this, if you like this stuff, you know, please don't send me your video. I'm, I'm not going to look at it. Um, but anyway, for a while I was trying it. And so this hitter sent me his video and he said, hey, what do you think? And I said, hey... You know, among other things, I, I think your barrel is getting a little too deep, you know, bat wrap or whatever. And I sent him a comparison of, say, Albert Pujols. And, hey, look, you know, you versus Albert Pujols is, is pretty clear. And he, and he sent me an email back, which is a very intelligent um, email. And he said, oh, I really appreciate that. You know, what about Carlos Gonzalez? And he's got even more wrap than me. And it kind of gets us into this paradox where we say, how can a hitter will improve when a successful hitter has the same flaw? And, you know, maybe it's true, maybe it's not. You know, would would, would Carlos Gonzalez do better with less bat rap? You know, maybe he would, maybe he he would not. So you have this question that's kind of sometimes true and sometimes not. And uh, it, it just... This, this is kind of stuff really interests me. So kind of, you know, Spurn is thinking, you know, what do we do from there? Well, if we're going to grade mechanics, it seems to me, or it seems to really a lot of people, and there should be some kind of grading key. You know, if you're going to give an exam, there should be an answer sheet. So, you know, what do we pick for a gold standard? And so, you know, I started with Albert Pools. I sent him Pools. And so let's just play a few of his clips and kind of take a look at some of the things he's doing. Okay, there's one from the front. Here's another one from the front and from the side. You know, I think I have another one here from the side. You know, very cool. You know, this is Albert Pools. And so I'm going to just show some of his characteristics. You know, this is nothing you probably it's, haven't seen before. And we look at him from the side. You know, he has some lateral translation of his body. You know, basically he's moving towards the pitcher. His head doesn't go up then down. You know, he just he keeps it steady and then moves down as, in relation to his body. Once he started his rotation, it's really about a fixed angle. You know, from his waist to his head, we saw he's very, very upright. We saw them from the front view that his barrel works behind him, you know, what I call a flat swing. And then from the side view, his barrel works behind the ball, you know, really nicely, whether you want to call this a deep swing or whatever. So we also, if you follow me, you know that I'm a big believer in N equals 1, you know, sample size equal 1. We need to look at it a little bit more. So if we're looking for a gold standard, how about Joey Votto? You know, he's a very good hitter. You know, what is he doing? So here's him from the front. Okay. This is a home run, so it's, we're off to a good start. Here's him from the side. Okay. One or two more. Here's him from the rear side. All right. Here's him from the front. You know, definitely not getting his flat there. As you say, a pull holes. And then from the, from the back view, we can really see here, he's got, a, you know, quite a bit of jackknifing. <laughs> you know, really tilting back. So if we, could, if we compare the two guys, you know, comparing these hitters, you know, this Votto moves as he does have some lateral translation in the body, but definitely not near as much. We saw his, his head goes up and down, so he's not consistent with pulls there. Rotation about a fixed angle, you know, definitely not. You know, uh, Votto's got a lot of jackknifing. Barrel working behind him in the front view, you know, not at all. But, you know, Votto is, Votto is very steep in that, in that angle from, you know, what I say. Yeah, but the barrel does work behind him in the side view. So there's some, some things here 
And there's some things that agree, some things that don't agree. All right, so when we look at this, we have two very good hitters, and you know I think they're different command, uh, different mechanics. We look at basically the kinematics and the kinetics of what they're doing, and they're different. I mean, the bodies are moving in different ways, the bat's definitely moving in a different way. So to me, we have a, this paradox. You know, can we say hitter A would be better with bit, a hitter B swing, or vice versa? You know, would it be true for one of them and not the other? And so. You know, to me, this is you know how do we how do we move forward from this? This is a tough question for me, and you know, I just wanted to throw this in. I, I couldn't really think of a better place, but uh, Pete Lawrence in Success Leaves Cues, he he put some clips of Votto, and he said, "Would you would you like his swing if you didn't know his name was Joey Votto?" And that's a fantastic question. I mean, honestly, like there's some things about Votto swing I'm not a big fan of this jackknife. You know, would he be better if we fix that? And it's like, it, how do we go from there? So I know what you're thinking of uh, uh, some of you guys. Say, hey, Jerry, you're, you're really missing the boat here. They're, they're swinging the same. They all have good mechanics. Is this a difference of style? Like I said, I'm an engineer, so I bring this perspective of it when I think of like a design. And so basically on the left we have a Chevy Impala, and on the right we have a Toyota Camry. And you would never walk up to the designer of these cars and say, hey, these cars are exactly the same. The only difference is style. You know, the designer of the engine of these cars, they're liable to punch you in the face. Now, granted, it's not going to hurt very much because you're getting punched by an engineer. A little engineering joke there. But it's, it's really, in my point of view, it's kind of a ridiculous statement. You know, you would never say that. And so, you know, from, from a hitting standpoint, I say the same thing. Let's not brush this under the rug. You know, if, you know, what isn't style here? I mean, they're delivering the barrel in different ways. They have different swing plane. Their torso, basically how they express power through their torso is different, you know. And, and so I'm trying to get people to, you know, not be scared of this. You know, embrace the variation, you know. Um, it, it's a good thing, you know. By allowing a, a bigger window, we we can allow more mechanics, if you will, to be successful. And you know, there's been studies here that uh, striving for optimal movement patterns, you know, may not be wise, or at least teaching everyone towards a, a certain uh, template is not always wise. And so, you know, along these lines, I really like this quote from Keith Davids. You know, looking at both inter and intra individual movement variability, he says, from this new perspective, variability of performance has been viewed as more functional emphasis mine since a consistent outcome can be achieved by different patterns of joint relations. And so basically, people can do the same thing or achieve the same result, the same outcome is what's important by different ways. And so this is something, like I said, it's, it's going to open our window, guys. You know, as, as hitting instructors, we're saying there's more ways to be good. You know, this is a good thing, so embrace it. You know, but while I'm on this, you know, don't act like, I, don't perceive me that I'm saying that these hitters don't have things in common. They do, and we're actually going to discuss some of those things, and, and, and they are important. But I don't believe they're swinging the same thing, same way, and I believe there's some variation. I believe that's actually a good thing that we can see that successful hitters can achieve good results in a very, in a very varying fashion. So just to keep going on in this, um, you know, if we look at optimal mechanics, you know, what are swing mechanics? You know, is, is, is there such a thing as optimal mechanics? And so we, if we define swing mechanics, it's basically a solution to a multi-objective problem. And so, you know, we look at our objectives in terms of hitting, we're trying to have, provide swing power so we can hit the ball hard and far. We're trying to bring swing acceleration so we can catch up to fast pitches. We want to have flexibility. We want to cover, you know, the strike zone. And so, if you follow my stuff, you know, last year I wrote an article that was, I was really uh, surprised, it was, it was well received, about this concept of Pareto optimality or Pareto efficiency. And so, uh, my man Pareto, he's an engineer, he developed this concept in the early 1900s, and it basically goes like this. If, if you have a multi-objective problem, you know, there exists a solution or a solution set in which optimization of one objective cannot be increased without degrading the optimization of another, okay? And so this has big impacts in economics and game theory. Where I learned about it is engineering, like I said. And it's really a neat, a neat, um, neat way of looking at things. And so basically, as you get better and better, when you cannot optimize any, any more, you have this Pareto frontier of solution sets. And like I said, on the right here, we have just a two objective problem. We can see this Pareto frontier where, where solutions get closer and closer, you know, asymptotically closer to this line. And so you're trying to get basically in the origin with this utopia point, but you can't get there. You can't optimize every single thing to the maximum and get there. All right? What's really neat about this is, is basically this is a, a 2D problem, but you know, for every objective you add, it, it grows in a dimension. So some of the ones I've done are like four and five dimensions, and then we start weighting objectives with different values. It, it really gets it really gets fun. 
But basically, we can get to these solutions, like all along these lines, these green dots, we can get them by, by different ways, okay? And how you pick your favorite one is really, it really can be sub subjective, okay? And I'm going to talk about that a little bit in the future. But, we, uh, you know, basically, this, this Pareto optimality concept can be applied to both hitting and the swing as well. You know, we want to optimize the use of our trunk and our hips and our arms and legs. And so we can see that we can get on this Pareto frontier by different ways, okay? And one thing I want to point out is, is when this is presented, this, this concept of Pareto efficiency, people think it's, it's a complete give and take. And it's not always true. Like I said, on the, on the far right, we have solutions that are very poor. And so we can improve both objectives um, by, by improving our, how we choose our, our, uh, our variables. And so this has been proven in, in various studies, including the famous one by Schmidt, basically uh, how speed and accuracy aren't always uh, conflicting. So just to give you kind of an example of this multi-objective optimization problem, let's say we're going to, our object, our task is to go driving, okay? We have some objectives here, all right? We want to obey traffic laws, you know, to keep our insurance rates low. We want to drive the fewest miles. I drive an electric car, so that's, that's something that's always important to me. I don't want to run out of juice, okay? So we look at our first task. You know, I'm just going to go down the block. I'm only going to go like six houses down. And when I look at it, I pull up on Google Maps, there's really only one solution, you know, I, there's, I mean, I shouldn't say that, there's one Pareto optimal solution. There's tons of ways to get there, but they're all Pareto non-optimal or Pareto inefficient. And so that's it, you know, I have a very simple task and there's only one solution. But if I look at this, if I just want to go to my friend's house on Graham Street, there becomes two Pareto optimal solutions. And so what gives? You know, it's the same task, but now I have two solutions. Well, it's because it came, became more complex, okay? But also look at this, like I said, I have two Pareto optimal solutions. Um, both of them are half a mile away. And both of them I can get there by obeying the traffic laws. And so which solution I choose is really subjective. All right? The path on the right, I'm in the car a little bit longer. Is that good or bad? Maybe I can listen to a podcast. You know, the path on the left, I get to see the park across the street. You know, either way, they're both optimal solutions. They're both good, equally good. And so which one I choose is subjective. And so you, are you kind of getting to see where you can pick a hitter versus another hitter in terms of you know, who's a better example to be for mechanics, it's really quite subjective, or it can be. And so just kind of rounding this out, you know, as the tax comp complexity grows, so does a possibility for more equally good solutions. Like I said, for every objective, it kind of, um, you add a dimension. Instead, like I said, preferred solutions are objective. And so we have to kind of pick things. Do we want to see the park? Do I want to listen to the song that's on the radio? Whatever. And so if you think about this in terms of movement, Swinging a bat is pretty complex, you know, also hitting is, is pretty complex, you know, maybe the most complex movement in all sports. And so, you know, we have a lot of solutions, and some of them are good and some of them are bad. Like I said, you know, basically, as we start growing in objectives, some of them are good, some of them are bad. And so what I want you to take from this is beware this linear extrapolation of a nonlinear problem. And what I mean by that is, and this is arguments been made by a few people, you know, hey, there's a, there's a, this is a perfect example of a bicep curl. I can look at it up in my exercise man manual, and there should be a, a perfect technique for hitting. And that's uh, and that's a, 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 a vast overestimate. You know, we're really extrapolating a task from hardly any complexity to something that's extremely complex, and we just we just can't do that. It's a, it's a not a va valid extrapolation. Okay, just to kind of you know, where are we? kind of refresh what we've done so far. We've looked at this and we said, there is this a set of swing mechanics that optimize the body for, you, for hitting a baseball. A set, a set is a key word. And we also said, hey, variability, if we're gonna start thinking about this, is not so bad. It's actually a good thing. It's gonna widen our window of success, okay? We talked a lot about mechanics, you know, like I said, what are swing mechanics? Let's dive in that a little bit farther. So we basically see it's a motor control problem. All right, we're trying to use our body to swing the bat. I'm trying to do it optimally, whether that's Pareto optimality or just plain old, just keeping it with optimal. And so we're trying to control our degrees of freedom. And what I mean by that, think of all our joints, you know, each one can do various movements. And so if you add them all up, I mean, word I use, you know, we have a grip of de degrees of freedom here, just really an abundance of movement possibilities. And just how do we can control them? You know, how do we, how do we pick the best way or the best set of ways to control our body. And so this, this problem, this uh, degrees of freedom problem, was really formulated by Nikolai Bernstein. 
And so he's kind of the father of biomechanics, and he examined mechanics and movement in the early 1900s. And his experiments were really slick, especially considering the time frame. So what he did is he filmed a bunch of manual labor workers, and basically, um, and also, and later on, guys, uh, he examined gait as well. But what he found in, in the blacksmith's example was that skilled workers showed tremendous accuracy despite very motion technique. And so they weren't swinging exactly the same way, yet they were still hitting where they wanted to be to, to shape their object. And so from this, he made some pretty cool conclusions and, and also started some, some the principles of, of biomechanics and motor learning. And so he theorized that in early school acquisition, we actually don't have good control of our degrees of freedom, and we actually lock them down. This has been shown many, many times, and that with mastery comes actually control over our degrees of freedom. And one of the, one of the studies I really think is cool is, is uh, shooting. If you ever shot a gun, you know, when you're early, you think you're going to lock out your shoulder, lock out your elbow. And what we found is in high-level shooters, actually, there's a lot of variability. They're actually fine-tuning the, uh, their shoulder joint and elbow joint. It's a really neat study. This has also been showed for long jumping, triple jumping, you know, many, many other things that actually there's a lot more control and variability instead of just eliminating degrees of freedom. And so, you know, if we think about this, we've seen this before. This is this video over here my, is my son, you know, in throwing. You know, he's two years old and he's a handsome devil and he's got his, his bust in his hand. There goes my daughter. But I mean, he's basically going to lock everything out except his elbow joint. And he's going to, he's eliminated as many degrees of freedom as possible just to complete the task of throwing the ball. Okay? And, you know, what is bat drag? That drag is pretty much locking out the elbow joint and you know, locking out the shoulder joint and turning like a, a beast. You know, eliminating quite a few degrees of freedom just to kind of basically get as much control as we can have. Okay, and so we look at this. This is not what we want. You know, we want to gain control of these degrees of freedom. We want a really robust movement. So now I'm kind of introduce this word to you, this concept of having robust mechanics. And so we think about this. Really, mastery involves making con control more abstract. And instead of saying, I'm going to lock out my shoulder joint for shooting a gun, I'm going to control the weapon. Okay? And so if you think about this, this is kind of an example. So we're going to balance a broom on our hand. Okay? So we have a couple ways of thinking about this. We can lock out our hand, we can stand on really flat ground, we can try to get no wind, and that basically is trying to eliminate as degrees of freedom as possible. And it's just not going to work. And, you know, just you just can't keep your hand perfectly stale just by locking out everything else. Or you can say we're going to allow movement of our arm. You know, we're going to be able to swing back and forth and, and kind of steady this. If you're thinking about that, it's a more difficult execution, but eventually the better one if we want to be good at this. And so really, like I said, if we get more abstract, the goal changes from keep our hand steady to keep the broom steady, which is really more important. It's really the object we're trying to control. So bringing this back to hidden, we can see with Pools and Vado, they do have similarities, it's just more abstract, okay? You know, the big one is getting the barrel behind the ball. You know, they use a stride to set up the swing. You know, maybe we want to use the reflexive properties of muscles, things like that. They're more abstract and a little bit harder to see and define. You know, versus things that are very static or very, you know, cookie cutter, or very almost quantitative, you know, stride an X percentage of your height or use more hip versus rotation versus hip extension. Those things aren't like that. They don't, those common things don't exist in, in, in high-level hitters. Okay, but they all very, they all have reached a high level of success. So how do we get there? How do we get masters of movement? How do we get to this level where we have abstract control and control of our degrees of freedom? And one thing that's really consistent in, in how we get there is we need to have some feedback. You know, we need to know if we're doing a good job or not. And so you know, breaking this down into broad classes of feedback, we can look at knowledge of process or KP or knowledge of result, KR. Okay. So looking at these a little bit farther, knowledge of process, you know, basically it's it's coaching technique, you know, it's qualitative, you know, say turn your hips more. Um, and really that brings a focus internal to the individual and things like driving your back knee down. And I, you know, one, one thing is, is clear here, is a coach isn't required to give you knowledge of process. You can video yourself and, and check it out later. And the other form of feedback we see is knowledge of result. And basically, did you succeed or not? It's quantitative, you know, did that last throw go farther, did it go faster? And so it really brings a focus external to the, the individual. You know, did you hit the ball into the net when you're serving on tennis? Or, you know, did you hit it over? And so really it gives rise to this concept of self-organization. And we're going to talk about this specifically because it's kind of a neat concept. So which is better? It, it really depends. You know, there's a ton of studies on this. Um, I'll, I'll encourage you to, to get, all, get on the internet and check them out. They're all very interesting. Um, knowledge of process may be beneficial more early and uh, for learners, 
but then you want to shift maybe to, to knowledge or results. And there's been an analogy of a gardener, which I really like. I've actually used that myself. You know, basically in the beginning, you work with the plant, you plant it, and then then you let it grow, and you worry about more about the environment, things that are external to it. Um, knowledge or results has been uh, shown successful in a lot of studies, all the way from um, balancing on a surfboard to golf to to you name it. But it's up to a point. You know. Um, once the focus becomes too external to us, it actually breaks down. But it's also been shown that too much knowledge of process can be detrimental. So it's, it's really difficult. Like I said, um, you know, a big thing, we have to be careful extrapolating studies from tasks that maybe aren't as complex as hitting. It does seem to be that, that knowledge result is superior to knowledge of performance, but you, know, you really have to, have to examine what you're trying to do and what you're trying to accomplish and how the experiment is set up. And so... Um, you know, knowledge of result really gives rise to this really cool concept of self-organization. It's basically knowledge of the result to the limit. And really it, it comes from Bernstein's principle that the body will organize itself in accordance with the overall goal of the activity. And when I first heard this, I was like, man, that's the coolest thing ever. You know, it, um, just, just figure it out. And I, I think that there's not a lot to that, but let's, let's explore this a little bit more. And so here's to me is is Bernstein principle to the limit. You know, here's this guy, he's a 60 year old man, and basically if you just lock somebody in a gym with a basketball and said figure out how to shoot, you know, this would be the guy. You know, this guy knocked down 209 three-pointers, which was a, for a while was a Guinness World Record. You can see his form here, it's 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 you know pretty efficient if you will. You know, he basically went in there and, and figured out how to do it and uh, we can kind of stop his difficulty. He just keeps knocking him down. But when we look at this, there's it's a little bit different than say Clay Thompson, and I just watched the Warriors lose. I can't friggin' believe that happened. But anyway, we can see that his technique is quite a bit different. You know, Clay's doing a lot more work, if you will. You know, really, it gives rise to this concept of efficiency. You know, do we, is that something we really should be striving from, from, uh, from a motor movement? Maybe, maybe not. But we can see here, you know, why did this not work? You know, why did this guy not end up shooting like Clay Thompson? You know, why do they have different form? Why does this guy kind of have the just a flick two-handed set shot versus Clay Thompson's. And so really, you know, the guy on the left, you know, not to take away what he did, you know, he lacks the environmental stimuli of the game. Basically, he had no constraints. And so he really, really did find the most efficient way of solving the problem. You know, we can look at this, and the problem is, did you make it or not? And so he figured out a way to consistently do it. It may not be the best for actually playing basketball. And so, you know, we think about this, well, then maybe we should just do what Clay did, you know, or maybe we should strive for what Clay does, you know, should we just play games? And to me, this is Darwinism at its finest. You know, you either are going to figure it out and become very, very good, or you don't. You know, you're going to become a guy who finishes playing baseball and goes to engineering school and 15 years later starts a hitting block. <laughs> and so when we look at this, you know, self-organization in games, just go out there and play games, and we think about it, it's really the most common thing we see. It's our model we're using right now in hitting, or in baseball in general. You know, basically travel ball, play hundreds of games a year, and, and you're going to figure it out or you're not. You know, the, the cream is going to rise to the top. And, you know, who, who was the, I forget, Monriac, I can't remember his name, or Buxton. I mean, who are these guys hitting instructors? You know, they, they're, they're just playing a lot of games and figuring it out. It's, it's really a feast or famine, adapt or perish in, in that sense. And so, you know, look at these guys who are, are taken high or who have a high level success, like a Mike Trout or whatever. You know, there's, there's good responders. And I'm going to talk about this a little more, what that means. But, um, you know, you may think this is crazy and a lot of people rag on the system, and I have it too in the past, but there is precedence for this. You know, um, if you follow USA Volleyball, you know they're very successful. And so, um, John Kessel, the director of USA Volleyball, you know, asked, what do you do? Do you do a, have a certain strength and conditioning program, this and that? And, you know, they do. He said, by and large, we play a lot of volleyball, and you know the game teaches the game, and you know this is really true. For reaching the highest levels, it's it's extremely hard to predict. I mean, this has been studied like in a, the physical characteristics of professional baseball players. If you know someone's a baseball player and you know much lower body power, how much grip strength they have, blah blah blah, you can pretty much um, ascertain what level they're at. Whether it's rookie, single A, double A, triple A, except for triple A to MLB. You know the correlations break down basically between the the connection between AAA and, and Major League Baseball. It's it's harder to predict whether they're a minor league player at the highest level or a Major League Baseball player. And you can see similar things for 
Olympic throwers, you know, at a certain level, college, high school, whatever, you can show correlations between certain things, and then at the highest level, this breaks down. So there is, you know, precedence for this stuff. Just let them figure it out. You know, the, the like I said, the cream is going to rise to the top. Darwinism at its finest. But it's not going to work for everybody. You know, not everyone is this good responder. What I mean by this good responder is basically how you adapt to things. And this has been shown in, in multiple things, whether it's, you know, looking at, um, how people respond to a certain diet or aerobic exercise or whatever. You, you, you do the same thing for 100 people, you're going to get a bell curve of success. And some people are going to respond really well. Some people aren't going to respond hardly at all. And, um, you know, why this could be, you know, maybe you had the, the wrong development at the right time. Maybe you're late, you're late, um, late bloomer. Maybe this is not your personality. You know, maybe you need, it just didn't work for you in games. And so um, a few years ago, I read this article by uh, Mike, Mike Ronald about the corrective extras bell curve. And it was just like, of course, you know, like I said, if you, if you have 100 people do the same thing, some are just going to really knock it out of the park. And this, for him, it was for, in regard to physical therapy. It really works for anything, whether it's um, teaching in school, you know, whatever. If you if you formulated everything and said, everybody, here's our environment, you know, let's see who responds. Some are going to do really well and some are going to do really poor. You know, maybe this system failed because you had poor coaching. Maybe coaching actually got in the way of, of rising to the top. You know, if you just force everyone to do the same thing, which just kind of falls into this corrective exercise bell curve. But bottom line, you know, what are the reason? It kind of doesn't matter. Playing games alone isn't good enough for some players just because hitting in games is, ex is extremely complex. And for some people, they just can't learn in that environment. All right? So that leads what else? If we're not going to figure out in games, or we're not just going to throw up our hands in the air and say play 100 games a year, and, and we'll, we'll see what, if that works for you. We're going to try to get through through practice, okay? And this is kind of the hard truth of this in that for hitting, practice is inherently self-limiting, all right? It's, it's part practice. We're taking a lot of the, the stimulus away. You know, we're not facing live pitching, which is a big difference between hitting off a tee and, and say, front toss. And so when anytime we do part practice, transfer is not guaranteed into, into hitting the games. It, it's, it's a difficult problem. For some people, it does. Some people, it doesn't. It's, it's based on a lot of things, like I said, how you adapt to this, whether it's your personality or whatnot. And so, like I said, again, we have to be aware of extrapolating this from a, a non-layer problem. You know, like I said, T does not always go to, to hitting. And a really good example of this, there was a study done a few years ago that was published in the European Exercise Journal. And um, what they found is that divers, their form versus diving off a springboard versus diving on dry land, the mechanics were different. And if you think about that, that doesn't really make any sense. You know, divers should be trying to do the exact same thing every time. It really shouldn't be matter whether you're doing off a springboard or into the water or springboard into, into blocks. And like, you know, why is that? Why does that make sense? And, uh, or, and that doesn't make sense. You know, why is that? And so we're going to talk about that a little more. It's a really neat study. But basically, that's going to provide us both good and bad news. But it basically shows us that just because we can do something or practice something on dry land or, or off a tee doesn't mean it's going to automatically transfer to our games. Okay? And if you think about this, think about mixed martial arts, the beginning of USC. You know, what did really successful? Did karate guys do it or taekwondo working on the forms? No. It was, it was Brazilian jiu-jitsu. And why is that? Because he spar every single session. You know, they're used to fighting or used to that competition. It was as close as, as they can to the actual real thing. And so they actually did really well. And you see later kickboxing became um, successful as well. Why is that? Sparring. And so that's it's, it's, an, it's the least part practice as you can get. And so that's a really important thing. So if we're going to try it in this method in terms of coaching and practice, you know, how are we going to do this? Are we going to do it qualitatively? Are we just going to sit there and say, turn your hips faster, blah, blah, blah? Are we going to do quantitative approach and we look at the exit velocity launch angles? You know, if you think about this, the limit of this is a slow pitch softball swing. Like I said, the, the, the Bernstein principle and the limit. And I'm not trying to knock exit velocity or launch angles. I do exit velocity testing. I don't do launch angles simply because I don't have a, a hit track. So if anyone wants to mail me one, I will use it tomorrow. You know, but you know, whatever we do, you know, basically quality co coaching is paramount. If we look at trying to develop hitters in practice only or in practice sessions, it's very difficult. It's very, very difficult. Like I said, it's inherently self-limiting because there's so much taking away from the live setting. It's, it's really, really a small part practice. And so if we're going to do this, if we're going to develop hitters in programs and in practice sessions, we, we've got to coach them upright. It's, it's a big challenge for us. All right. Let's take a breather. You know, where are we at? All right, well, back from the beginning, we saw the hitting and really swing mechanics in general are a multi-objective optimization problem, okay? We're trying to get our, our, our head around this concept that there's a set of Pareto optimal solutions in terms of swing mechanics. 
you know, we're not there yet, so we looked at how we get there, whether it's just playing in a ton of games or whether it's practicing. And we started examining that in terms of how we provide feedback and how we practice. So before moving forward, let's step back a second and really establish what we're after, okay? And so I started with this R word before, but now I want to reintroduce it. We really want to build a robust swing, okay? Whether it's pretty, whether it looks like somebody else, to me, it's not important. You know, we want to have a robust swing and robust movements. And what do I mean by that? Well, it has to be robust. It also handle different speeds. You know, first very fast swing. You know, speed changes. Blah blah blah. We need to be able to handle locations. You know, if you can only hit pitches up in the zone, is that very very robust? You know, no, it's not. And one that's I think that I'm I'm big on, and I think I like to get other people thinking about is this concept of flexible. You know, it's not so much cut in stone. Like you do this, you do this, you do this. It's 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 not so much like baking cake, but it's a very flexible process. And I have this clip up here of Miguel Cabrera and this was in 2013 during the ALDS I'm actually in the stands for this and we're gonna watch this clip and it's Miguel Cabrera hits one out in September in the Coliseum which is it's, it's pretty impressive well, what I haven't told you about this before is Miguel Cabrera did this with a, um, a sport hernia and so it's uh, uh, really impressive you know how could he do this it's because he has a flexible swing you know his lower body was basically you know, he wasn't able to use it, wasn't able to transfer any power up through his core, which kind of shows you how important the lower body is. But there, I mean, anyway, so his swing didn't break down. He was still able to achieve success because he had flexible movements, okay? If you read the article about him, when it was at the Wall Street Journal, you know, all the different stride variations, how he's able to do this, he probably has the most flexible swing mechanics or swing movements in all of baseball. So how do we get there? How do we get this robust swing? And I'm going to talk about the three I's. And so in terms of our practice, we really need to have incentive, intent, and it needs to be interesting. Okay? And so I'm going to give you an example of the three I's. And like I said, I'm an engineer. This is something we do. We use HALT. And what is HALT? HALT is highly accelerated life testing. Okay? So say we have a product. Say we have this alternator. We want to test it. We want it to be a really, really good product. We want it to be a robust product. So what do we do? We stick it in this HALT chamber and we beat the ever-loving crap out of it. Okay, if it's designed to go up to 100 degrees Fahrenheit, we're gonna push it to 200 degrees Fahrenheit. If it's designed to uh, survive X vibration, we're gonna push it to 3X of that. And basically what we're trying to do is we're trying to break the design, we figure out where it broke, we improve it, and we repeat. We keep beating the hell out of this thing until we, we really can't improve the design so much any, anymore. Okay, we're trying to find flaws. We want this thing to break so we can improve the design. That's the goal of this thing. So we think about this in terms of the three eyes, and we have incentive here. We want to find the flaws, improve the design, because if it if it breaks down, it's, and it's under warranty, it's going to cost us money. And so we have a clear intention. The clear intention is to find these weak spots. It's, it's very very important that you understand what you're trying to do. All right, we're going to talk about that more. And it's also interesting in terms of design. We could just sit it on the table and see if it breaks. You know, over 50 years. But we provide an interesting stimuli to it. We, like I said, it's random. We test it way beyond the expected environments, and we're trying to find weak spots. Okay, so that's an example of, of these concepts of how to build something that's more robust. And I said, you know, why do you do that? Well, you know, the hitting analogy is you know, you're never going to see somebody who can throw 98 and have a slider, wipe out slider, and can paint the corners. You know, whatever you think you're ready for, there's always someone. Who's gonna who's gonna test you? So you want to have something that's really robust, really resigned, whether it's an alternator or whether it's swing mechanics. All right. So like I said, the first one is incentive, and this one is is, is important. Maybe you're a former major league baseball player; it doesn't apply to you. But you know, people come to me, you know, why should they listen to me? And I mean this on two levels. You know, why change? You know, what I mean on the conscious level. You know, why should they listen to somebody? You know, on the subconscious level as well. And you know, on the conscious level, you can do things like show video, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. But on the subconscious level, it's a little more difficult because there's this concept of, of reinvestment. You know, basically, we have this this control system that's kind of kind of conservative. I mean, if you look at even like a Charles Barkley, you know, he's had success. You know, he's hit. If, you, if you're a golfer, you know, you hit that one shot that was just really pretty. You think if I can just recreate that shot, you know, 50 times in a round, I'll be really successful. And so there's this concept of reinvestment where, like, why should you want to do this? Why should you invest in this new pattern? Okay, and we're, we're going to talk about that. We need to make these old patterns break and so that they're no longer attractive. And so we're going to provide some incentive on both the conscious and the subconscious level. Intention. Yeah, attention is getting more popular. It's really cool. It's coming about. But there's a little more to it than just hit the ball hard. And what I mean by that is 
there's this intention action model. It's, it's um, brought to my attention by, by Franz Bosch, and basically that we really need to have an idea of what we're doing. And it, the, the more clear it is, the better. Um, like I said, this, is, um, this has been shown in studies, like I said, the, the diving study, where basically they found the error or you know, why they weren't consistent between jumping off a, a springboard and going into water versus going into, into blocks is that there, there, there wasn't any intention. The intention was to dive in the water with as, as little as, as splash as possible. So by taking that attention away, it, it, was, it was difficult to recreate. Like I said, this is both good and bad news. I mean, you know, we can change by changing the intention. We're actually going to be able to develop new motor patterns. It's going to be something we're going to talk about in a little bit. This has been shown in hitting as well. They did a study on hit hitters in Japan. Did you know that many people who suffer from athlete's foot don't treat it correctly? Try Lamisil cream. It Sorry about that. I had a little advert in the background pop up. So anyway, this hitting study, they did an examination of uh, professional hitters in the Japanese league, and basically they found within a certain era of hitting off a tee was, I forget, 50 millimeters. And they took the ball away and they said, hey, just swing above the tee. Just try to hit, you know, skim the top of the tee. They found the error went up greatly, and it was because you know, there's not a clear attention. You know, before it's hitting the ball, now it's like, ah, you know, what do I do? And so this intention action model is really important. Basically, we organize our movements based on the intention. So we need to have a really clear intention. Now, this is something, uh, this is a, I, you see reference here, Eric's if you're familiar with his study. He has a new book out, um, Peak, and so I, I encourage you to check it out. It's, a, it's interesting as well. But uh, yeah, basically, Anders Erickson is the original formulator of this, uh, the 10,000 hour rule. And basically, what he says in this book is, is whether your, your, your goals are large or small, the outcome needs to be very clear. You know, it's, it's easier to become, um, say, your goal was to run a three hour marathon versus become a good baker you know it, it the more you quantify this the more clear it is the more likely you're going to achieve success you know in terms of attention like i said it's a really a cool thing you know Bosch talks about start at the end point there's been studies on this um i believe there's a study on, on tennis swings and basically encouraging people that, that how you finish your swing is important versus uh, the focus on how on a, on how you on a, how your technique is so a hitting example of this you know provide clear intention versus say rotate your hips you know what, what does that mean and say well Point your belt buckle towards the pitcher. And you can kind of see this is and providing clear intention is going to kind of go along with external focus. So attention is really a, a very important thing. We're going to talk about it just a little bit more in the case study. Like I said, it says things have to be interesting. You know, we have to grab the attention of our motor control and, and say, hey, this is something that's important and you better get good at it. And this is analogous to say strength, can, strength training. If we just keep doing the same 10 push-ups every day, we're not going to get that much stronger. You know, we need to provide variation as well. It's another way to keep things interesting. I had to do it. I had to reference myself. Um, one of my last articles, I talked about an analogy of weighted bats. Now, it's not really a, a strength program. It's more just challenging our, our CNS. And so if you, if you haven't seen that one, check that out. It's, I just had to uh, reference myself. So we can keep things interesting by, like I said, providing variation. We can change the environment. We can make ourselves tired. We can do all kinds of things to keep challenging our central nervous system to say, hey, this is important, something I need to get better at. Okay, just really quickly, I only made one slide on this because honestly I was fading whenever I was putting my slides together. This gives rise to constraint training. And um, I, I just threw this in there because when I first heard of this a few years ago, it was really a mysterious concept and I, di I didn't understand it, but it's not that not that tricky. We can basically provide constraints to choose a, a better movement. Okay, and you can do this in a, a variety of ways. Like I said, this, this concept of reinvestment is really critical. We need to make what a person does, a movement pattern, unattractive. We need to make it break down. We also need to put them in a way where the choice we want or the better choice is more attractive. Um, a really cool thing about this is um, RNT by Greg Cook, a reactive neuromuscular training. Is that he he does this from a physical therapy standpoint. His, his first case study was with ACL injuries, but we are also going to look at it in terms of hitting and how it's, it's a really cool concept. And so, like I said, constraint training. I just want to introduce it here and say it's not as as tricky as at least I considered it was in the beginning. It really deserves its own piece. I really recommend the BPG video again. They do a much better job on me, but like I said, I was fading when I put this together. All right, so let's just get to this. You, you hung with me long enough, we're at the, pretty much the 40 minute mark. So let's just see some of these, these concepts in action. So this is a hitter, a 15 year old hitter. And this is the first time he came and hit with me. So we're gonna play his swings, slow motion. You can pretty much see he was trying to emulate. I mean, one and only right now, super popular. Okay, so playing through his swings, you know, I, I saw a couple things. I saw his hand path was really going down. That's gonna be a big focus to me, is that 
everything is going down. All right, he, he doesn't work his... Do I show on the next slide? Yes. So we can see his, his hand path, you know, basically as going into contact, his hands is below his elbow, and so he's kind of got this downward angle. So for me, well, you know, what did I do? You know, um, I'm trying to provide incentive, and I remember that's important. So basically I did a video comparison of him versus Josh Donaldson. That's interesting him. You know, that's, that's going to provide him incentive because he's a big Josh Donaldson fan. And so on a conscious level, he's going to start to think about, hey, maybe this guy knows what he's talking about. You know, maybe this is important to me. Okay, so looking at him here in contact, I'm like, okay, you know, this is what we need to work on. I'm gonna show you a couple frames later. This one's kind of on a low pitch to kind of exaggerate it. Like, hey, we need to get this hand path a little bit better. You know, we need to get this this uh, this bottom hand up above this rear elbow here. And to me, I said, hey, this is really a function of how you're working your shoulders. You know, at this equivalent position, you can really see Donaldson's shoulders starting to work and kind of work under where your shoulders are very level. All right. So how am I gonna tackle this problem? Am I going to grab a tee and a light bat maybe and sit there on a chair and just say, hey, turn faster? You know, that's not going to work, or at least that's not what I did. So what did I do? Um, I set up the L screen over here to the right, so I'm going to throw basically from his pool side. All right, and then I'm going to throw at this angle. So, you know, thinking about this, if his torso, if his shoulders aren't working fast enough, you know, how is he going to get to this swing? He's going to have a really hard time. Actually, what he told me is, he had a hard time on inside pitches. He got sawed off. So he doesn't have this pattern. He doesn't have this opening and getting and getting there quickly. All right. So I'm basically doing just like Greg Cook said. I'm feeding this function. You know, I'm making this extremely hard. I'm not boosting his confidence. I'm trying to break him down. All right. And then I also gave him a very clear intention. I want you to hit balls back over me. All right. I want you to hit balls over my head and not cut across them. All right. Balls have to be hit in the air and over the L screen. Okay, you know, basically, like I said, if we don't want this to just fly open and cut across our body, we're going to try to hit through this thing. And the swing thought, as I, the swing thought I wanted him to have is, I want you to finish your swing above your shoulders. All right, I'm, I'm providing him clear intention and what he want, want him to do in terms of a swing. We're not cutting across our body, but finishing up above our shoulders. Okay, so to kind of just break this down. You know, how am I providing these, or how am I satisfying these three guys? Well, I'm giving him incentive. You know, I showed him a comparison. Like I said, he's a big Josh Donaldson fan. And so I'm showing, hey, you know, look at this pitch. You know, this is one you got jammed on because you just you couldn't get your shoulders around. You know, I provided him incentive because I put him in this new environment. But the results are poor. You know, basically, I mean, the first few pitches I threw him, the first four or five, he missed. He he simply did not have that movement, and so he failed. And so I'm, I'm giving him good incentive here that hey, I need to figure this out. All right, I, like I said, I gave him a really clear intention. You know, I, for a swing. I want you to finish with your bat over your shoulder. I don't want you to cut across your body. So I'm constraining him there as well. The result, you know, I want you to hit the ball over the screen. There's a clear objective here. All right. How is this interesting? Well, it's a different environment, first of all. You know, he's, I'm putting him in something that he hasn't seen before and doesn't do very often. So it's interesting. It's, it's going to give him incentive to, to learn. You know, beyond that, once he started making contact and getting a little bit of handle of this, I'm going to change it up on him. I'm going to give him a, a heavier bat. I'm going to change this pitch speed. I'm going to throw at a steeper angle so it's even harder. Okay. In terms of coaching, you know, I'm, I'm going to put him in a no stride situation so he can't fly open his lower body. No, there's only this is constraint training. The only way he can make this happen is if he gets his torso working. All right. And in terms of cueing, I'm going to give him a little external focus. I'm going to say rip the handle apart. And so if you follow me, it's something I do a lot to kind of get that front shoulder going while also leaving the, the rear arm behind. Okay. So what do we do? We did this the first day. It's pretty much all we did. I took his eval, and then we, we did this for 30 or 40 minutes. He left me. I, I gave him some things to work on, and he sent me some checkup videos. And I said, no, it's not quite there. You keep working on it. And then he came back a couple, two and a half weeks later, and this is his first swings he took. I'm not saying he has a you know, major league all-star swing. But I think we did give him something he didn't have before. That's one of my favorite things to say is, as, as hitting instructors, as movement instructors, we have to give them what they don't have. Okay, He didn't have this hand path working up. His was all going down. Oops, sorry about that, guys. Well, that should work. Ugh. I'll show you some stills in the next frame. So here we go. So here's one on the, on the first one. He gets jammed and just, he can't get through. And this is the next one on the inside pitch. We can see he can get his shoulders around. We can see the hand path is better. The, the, the bottom hand 
or excuse me, the top hand is working with the elbow. You know, is it perfect? Absolutely not. I'm going to have to continue to break down that old pattern. That old pattern is established. He swung many, many times, and um, I'm, I'm going to have to keep breaking it down and make the new pattern more uh, more attractive, okay? But, you know, for, for one session, you know, we're on the right track. And so we're looking at this, you know, did we improve his swing? Does he have different swing mechanics? Or do we just make his movements more robust? You know, maybe it's a little combination of both. You know, like I say, instead of worrying about your swing mechanics, I, I worry about having command of your swing or command of your movements and basically make it robust. At the end of the day, you know, really, who cares? Uh, I mean, some guys, maybe your, your swing mechanics are limiting your ability to be robust. I don't know. You know, so we're going to put you in environments that, that make you more robust. And maybe that drives a swing change in terms of mechanics. I really don't care. You know, you can look at guys, especially at the higher level, you know, swing changes are going to be very difficult. And they're kind of very ingrained, but we can do things to make them more robust. And so that's that's just kind of a what you prefer. It's not as sexy to see some guys come to hit me and say, hey, we didn't really change your swing. I'm like, well, I'm just trying to make you more robust. And that's, it doesn't sell, but that's what I do. So thanks for sticking with me. This is my first full-length webinar. Hopefully we got through it alive. But if you have any questions, feel free to hit me. Hit me up on email. Um, sorry it's so long, but my joke is... Uh, the registry costs as much, um, no matter how long your URL is, so I decided to get every single letter I could. <laughs> and I'm also on Twitter a little bit, um, not as much as I used to be, but uh, Jerry Brewer, EBHI, East Bay Hitting Instruction. So, uh, yeah, I hope you enjoyed this. Send me some stuff, and um, I'm sure I'm going to be updating this and, and changing it as, uh, as I learn more and, and get more experience with this stuff. But it's something I wanted to put out, and I hope you guys enjoyed it. And Make your movements robust.